Scotty David, also known as juror number 50 in the Galen Maxwell trial, the guy who might be responsible for Galen getting a new trial, was questioned by Judge Allison Nathan out of the Southern District of New York. And she had a lot of questions for him, said, why did you fill out this questionnaire incorrectly? Apparently, you had some type of abuse happen to you. You said here you did not. What gives? And he said, you know, it's a big, annoying court document. It really was just a lot to fill out. And I was going through it quickly. He's not wrong. You can see here there are 29 pages of court documents as part of these preliminary instructions. This is what the jurors got before they went into the Galen Maxwell trial. And so we'll go through it. We're gonna see that question that juror number 50 marked wrong that is pretty much crucial to the entire case. We'll go through this. You know, it says, hey, don't write your name on any of this stuff. This is an official document. Of course, this would have been filled out before the Galen Maxwell trial started, but we're seeing that this was entered in as an exhibit during this sort of additional inquiry. Because if this juror was somebody who suffered the type of abuse and that abuse was material or it impacted the verdict, Galen Maxwell's attorneys are saying that was consequential, that merits an entire new trial that improperly biased the jury panel. And we get to do this whole thing over again. So it continues. It says you are sworn, right? The first full big paragraph here says you are sworn to give true and complete answers to all questions in this questionnaire, right? After the very introductory paragraph, we see here a whole thing. The purpose is to determine whether prospective jurors can decide this case impartially based upon the evidence presented at trial. The questions are not intended to inquire into personal matters. And so it's saying, look, you have to take your time on this. If you don't know how to answer that, th these questions, that's fine. You can say, I don't know here. There are no right or wrong answers, only truthful answers. And remember at the end of the second full paragraph after the introduction, we see here, remember you are sworn to give true and complete answers to all the questions. All right, if you need extra space, then you can answer those at any other time. And it says, don't discuss your answers and don't research any of this on your own. It goes through. You're not going to be required to disclose any of this stuff because this could compromise your privacy. But let us know if you have any issues with this. A summary of the case, they say. Big, long jury trials coming up. The defendant, Galen Maxwell. And so now you're a juror and you get this packet of instructions, preliminary questions, and you say, I know who that is. Jeffrey Epstein. What? Well, now you get a little bit excited. You get that adrenaline flowing. And so now you start to you know, want to know what else is going on with this. It says, has been charged with various offenses. We talked a lot about these. 1994, she was charged with all of these things related to Epstein. Epstein, of course, is allegedly dead. And a lot of people uh, who were involved in it are still roaming free while Maxwell, of course, is in custody. Maxwell has pled not guilty to all the charges and you're gonna be a part of the jury panel. And so take a look at this. The schedule is gonna be very grueling. We covered a lot of this on our YouTube channel. It says November 16th to Friday, November 19th, we've got a jury selection and then we've got trial for several days supposed to be six weeks, turned out to be a lot less than that. We thought this was gonna go on and we made a mind map with all sorts of tentacles going out all different which ways. Turns out prosecutors just needed a couple weeks because they didn't really call any witnesses or present any evidence. And it's easy to get through a trial quickly if you're not doing those things. So this continues on, says if you are selected, well, you're gonna come and participate in the remainder of the trial. And this is where we dive into the questions. Now that we have a little bit of a background on how this is all going to work, we can see the questions start with your ability to serve. Juror 50, are you sure that you can come here and serve? Do you have any unmovable commitments during this time? Nope, no unmovable commitments. How about this? Do you have any unmovable commitments mm, in January or November? All the way ja all until January 2022? Nope, no problems there. Not traveling internationally. And this question comes up, number four, is there anything, any reason why you can't really be here? And everybody's like, well, my son unfortunately has a t-ball game. So I have to go to the t-ball game. And the judge says, oh, well, is he going to have more of those? How old is he? Seven? All right. Well, he's going to have a lot more of those games. So uh, that is not going to be a serious hardship, sir. That is not going to be an extreme inconvenience, sir. You're going to have to come back and serve jury duty. And so they write here, no, 
This continues, says, do you have any personal commitments that would make it difficult for you to get to court by 9.30? Nope, no problems there. Any problems with English? Nope. Any medical concerns, illness? No, nothing there either. How about any medication that's gonna make you delirious or not able to sort of comp comprehend what's happening in front of us? Number eight says, no, nope, keeps going. And this is sort of like at the doctor's office. Like, no, I'm healthy. No, I don't have any of those ailments. Um, do you have any religious or philosophical beliefs that would make you unable to render a verdict in a criminal case. No problems there. How about the basic understanding of legal principles and some of these media restrictions? You know, if you can't follow the basic rules, like if you're somebody who just thinks that everybody who's been charged with a crime is guilty just because you believe every single police officer and prosecutor and judge, period, right? And there are people that do. There are people, many people who think that way. Well, that kind of makes you incompatible with the presumption of innocence. And if we can't even get you over that hurdle, well, well, there's not much we can do. Uh, thanks for being here and thanks for being open and honest. We're glad that you're not on this jury. So he says, do you accept this principle that under the law, the facts are for the jury to determine and the law is for the judge to determine? Okay, the judge tells you what the law is. You apply the facts to the law. You're required to accept the law as the judge explains it, even if you disagree with it. Do you accept this principle? He says, yeah, of course I do. No problem at all. And that's kind of a complex question, right? So he says, do you accept this? And so he read that question, apparently. Question number 10 was pretty clear on that. Up until this point, sort of like at a doctor's office. And then you have to always pause for that one question and go, wait, wait, wait a minute. Do I have yes or no? Or like there's a question. I think, I think this is on the uh, buying firearms form, right? It's all these questions. And then they try to get you with one at the last one. And you have to double check that one. And then you say, huh, you mark it correctly. And then you move on to the next one. Kind of one of the, and that makes you confirm that you're actually answering the right question. So he did, he switched sides and went with a yes. The law provides that they are presumed innocent. Galen Maxwell, presumed innocent. I know that really irritated a lot of people out there, but it's true. And she is presumed innocent. And it says, do you accept these principles? Yes, we do. Moving on, the law provides absolute right to defendants not to testify. Galen Maxwell doesn't have to take the stand at all. If she sits there on her hands and says nothing, you understand that you can't hold that against her. You understand that, right, Juror 50? Yes, I do, no problem at all. A juror is required to make law, by law, to make her decision solely based on the evidence that comes into this courtroom. You can't go on Google or get a text message from somebody, listen to conjecture, suspicion, or prejudice. Do you understand that and accept that? Yeah, I got that one too. And so now he's flipping over to the other side. It's just yeses, yeses, yeses all the way down. Under the law, the question of punishment is for the court alone to decide. And thus the, the issue of punishment shouldn't weigh into you deliberations. You get to decide innocence or guilt. I get to decide the punishment. Do you accept that? Yes, we do. Number four, he's pretty clear on a lot of these things. 15, you may hear testimony in this case that law enforcement officers recovered certain evidence from searches. Oh, this is a complicated question. And we're going to go back from a yes to a no here. The court will instruct you that those searches were legal and the evidence obtained from those searches is admissible. Do you have any feelings or opinions about searches conducted by law enforcement or the use of that evidence from their searches that would make you unable to be fair and impartial in this case. Would anything prohibit you from being fair and impartial? No. That's a complicated question if you're just flying through a jury questionnaire. You may hear testimony in this case from experts. Any experience with expert witnesses that would bias you? No, nope, no problems there. How about media coverage? From now, you are instructed to avoid all media coverage. Any reservations about that? Do you have any problems about not talking to the media? Nope, no problems with that either. All right. He's doing pretty good here. Says, have you served as a juror before? Nope. Have you ever served as a member of a grand jury? No. Experience as a witness, defendant, or crime victim? Oh, well, if you're the subject of abuse and it's of the same type that Galen Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein, Galen convicted on perpetrating against minors, well, many would consider themselves to be a victim at that point. They were a victim of that type of abuse. In fact, we heard from four of them who testified at the Galen Maxwell trial. Question 20, have you or has any relative or close friend ever participated in any criminal court case as a witness, plaintiff, or defendant? So no, right? And that is limiting that because we're talking about actual cases. Okay. So not a victim in any actual case. And there's no 20A or 20B. 
And then we see 21. Have you or a close friend ever been involved or appeared in a witness before? None of those apply. We skip down to 22. Have you ever been subpoenaed? No subpoena. Skip to 23. Ever been arrested or charged with a crime? The answer is no on that one. 24. Friend or family ever been subject of an investigation? 25. Have you ever been the victim of a crime? Have you or a relative or close friend ever been the victim of a crime? You got asked about this one. If you're the subject, if you're the victim of abuse, as he communicated to the media, well, wouldn't that make you the victim of a crime? And he answered that. He told the judge, he said, well, look, I didn't think of myself that way. I just thought of myself as somebody who went through this experience and I don't like to put myself in that frame. And so I don't think of myself as a victim. And so when I read this question, I thought, no, you know, I haven't been the victim of a mugging or some other sort of use of force or a robbery or any of those things. So no. And he explained that yesterday in the court proceeding. And so we skip over 25 and 25B because there's nothing to explain there. It says, have you or has any member of your family, either as individuals in the course of their business, had any dealing with the U.S. Attorney's Office or the FBI or any of these agencies? Says no. Down to 27. Any disputes with the feds about money with the government? Like, are you mad about the government about money? Mad about you know, taxes or something like that? Do they owe you some money? Because that might make you want to go against the prosecutors. And Lord knows the courts don't want that. 28 says, how about relationships with and the view of the government and the defense and other people? Anybody you know work with law enforcement or the justice system or the courts? Nope. And so pretty solid answers on the rest of these. Anyone you know have any association with the Southern District of New York? Anybody have any business with the FBI? No. Anybody know that NYPD? Nope. How about the U.S. Attorney's Office? Damian Williams or any of those people like Audrey Strauss, the U.S. Attorney, Assistant U.S. Attorney. We see here we've got personal relationship now with this case. Galen Maxwell. Personal relationship with the case participants. Do you happen to know Galen Maxwell or her family members? No, he says. No, of course not. And to personally know means, do you have some direct or personal knowledge? If you've only heard of them through social media, you know, that's not going to cut it. That's not personal knowledge. Do you or anybody you know personally, they write, know Epstein? No. Do you personally know anybody who works at the Southern District of New York? No. Do you know any of these prosecutors? And remember, here this was Maureen Comey, daughter of James Comey, Allison Moe, Lauren Pomerantz, and Andrew Rohrbach, all U.S. prosecutors prosecuting Galen Maxwell. Know any of them? No, 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 no. Do you know any of Galen's attorneys? And so we talked a lot about all of these people. Bobby Sternheim, Laura Menninger, Jeff Paleyuka. We've got Christian Everdell, all no's across the board on those. We see here, do you or anybody know the judge, Judge Allison Nathan? And the answers are no, so we don't fill any of those out. Now we get to a little bit of input from juror number 50. Juror 50 writes about knowledge of case and people, says, this case has been widely reported in the national and local media. Of course it has. There is nothing wrong with having heard about this case. It's important to answer all of the following questions honestly and truthfully. Before today, you ever hear anything about old Galen Maxwell? And he's honest here. He gets this one right. Yeah, of course I have. Who hasn't? If you're unsure, you answer yes. If you're unsure, how did you hear about this? Did you hear about it from the media sources? If you did, well, tell us where that came from. He says, look, I read it on a website that she was Jeffrey Epstein's girlfriend. And the source was CNN. Oh, no. Well, at least they got that one right, I probably. We see here 35 says, have you ever you know, personally formed an opinion about Miss Maxwell's innocence or guilt? And he says, no, of course not. Sure, right? <laughs> okay, but he says no, which is the right answer if you want to get on a jury. 36 says, based upon anything that you've read or seen, have you formed any opinions that would make it difficult for you to be fair and impartial? He says no. If you are unsure, it says before today, have you ever read or heard anything about Epstein? Yep. Again, heard about it from CNN. I heard about his death and that he was in jail awaiting trial. Yeah. He did, he did die, allegedly, awaiting trial. Have you verbally stated or posted your opinion about Maxwell or Epstein? He says no, didn't post anything about that on the internet. And based on everything you've heard, anything would make 
this difficult for you to think that Mr. Epstein, about Mr. Epstein might make it difficult for you to be fair and impartial. In this case, he says no. Anything about the lovebirds, Galen Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein, anything about their relationship that would make this problematic for you? No. And it just keeps going. And so you can see here, we're on page 20 of this thing. And you're probably you know, going out of your mind just like poor juror number 50 was. He's like, look, I've already answered all these questions. Can we just get to the point of this thing? Based on anything you have read, seen, or heard about Ms. Maxwell, including anything about the criminal charges, would you be able to follow the court's instruction, put that info out of your mind, and just focus on what you heard at trial? And he says, yes, I can do that. All right. Nature of the charges now, we're going to be talking about some pretty serious, heinous, horrendous crimes involving people of a certain category that are very, very difficult to talk about. Some things that people don't even want to face or even think about. Anything about the nature of this case and the accusations might make it difficult for you to be fair and impartial. You know, like anything that you can think of, like, you know, past history of being abused. Gosh, you know, let me think about, uh, no, nothing there stands out. Hmm. 43, any specific views about, you know, laws about age of consent or, you know, any type of activity between certain, you know, certain people of different, you know, age ranges, anything about that might make you unable to be fair and impartial. No, not, nothing about that. Any opinion about the enforcement of trafficking laws that might prevent you from being fair and impartial? No, nothing there either. You can see we're going to 45 now. He's finally picking up the pace now. He's like, all right, well, okay getting tired. We're on page 21. This packet's getting a little bit thinner, flipping through one after the other. Have you, a family member or anybody ever gone out and done any political lobbying to sort of support any of these causes? No. 46. The witness in this case might include law enforcement professionals. Would you have any difficult assessing the credibility of law enforcement professionals? Just like any other witness, some people will take a look at a law enforcement official and say, man, he's got a gun and a badge and he's all looking professional in blue and he's all cut up and talks in sort of nice, uh, rigid tone. This is very interesting. So he must be credible, whereas somebody else who's a lay person must be a liar because they don't have all of those same features. Would this make it problematic for you? He says, no, no issues there. So then we get forward. Witnesses, 47, in this case, may testify about abuse or assault. Would you have any difficulty assessing the credibility of the witnesses claiming assault or abuse just like any other witness? Okay, if a person comes out and says that I have been the victim, are you going to give them more credibility or less credibility? Are you just somebody who says, yeah, right? Or are you somebody who says, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry you went through that. We're going to do anything possible to right this wrong. Both could be unfair. Have you, here we go, 48. Question 48 is the big one. Have you or a friend or family member ever been a victim of sexual harassment, abuse, or assault? This includes actual or attempted or other unwanted advances by anybody, including a stranger, acquaintance, supervisor, teacher, or family member. 48, Scotty David, juror 50, writes, no. Oh, darn it. We continue, nothing in 48A, nothing in 48B. Now, if those were filled out, if this question had gone the other direction, and there were something filled here and something filled here, that would have been a pretty big red flag for everybody there in the courtroom, for the judge, for the prosecutors, and for the defense. They would have really taken a big deep dive into this. And 48B, it's a big section here. Have you or a friend or family member ever been accused of any of these types of things? No. And the rest of it you can see sort of goes on. 49 is not having to be answered 40, 50. Anything else that would affect your ability to serve as a fair and impartial juror, nothing. Do you wish for any of this to remain confidential because it would embarrass you? And he says, no. Do you wish for any particular answers to remain confidential because it would embarrass you? And he says, no. So he's been pretty open and honest about it. I, juror number 50, declare under penalty of perjury that the foregoing answers set forth are true and correct to the best of my knowledge. I have discussed, I have not discussed my answers with anybody else 
signed on the fourth day of November, 2021. And that's the end of the document. This was the leftover page. You see pages 26 out of 29. Anything else you wanna share with the court? Nothing on 28. And we wrap it up with page 29 with nothing else there. And so the big question, of course, as the judge takes all this into consideration, both sides are going to be preparing their briefs and making their arguments. Many people having to ask themselves, is Galen Maxwell going to get a new trial? Is this going to be so consequential that the judge is going to find that it is an improper prejudice against Galen such that she gets the chance to do this whole thing over again? We'll see. I'm a defense attorney. That's the argument I'd be making. And that's the argument that they are making. And we're going to see how the judge rules on it. We're going to continue to follow this along. So wherever you're watching this, I hope you decide to follow us, subscribe, like, and share this video with a friend or family member. I look forward to seeing you on the next one.